Good morning, everyone. It's Liz from Coral Expeditions with Ian Morris. I'm just going to give it a few minutes for um, everyone to join in and then we'll start our session on the Kimberley. Hope you're having a lovely day. Um, it's really good to see that um, everyone's um, joining and interested in all the webinars that all the companies have been doing. And we do thank you for your continued support um, that you're sharing or supporting Coral Expeditions. Um, Coral Expeditions, I may as well get started. If I can move my screen. Um, is all there. We have actually... Um, We've restarted sailing. We've um, started with our Great Barrier Reef cruises. So we've been operating those on the smaller vessel, the Coral Discover, since October this year. But it's been a, a, a long and slow process, ensuring that we have everything covered in particular to make sure that our guests feel comfortable traveling with us, our crew feel very comfortable traveling with us. And we also have all of our travel agents that um, want to make the bookings and um, support us and the, the whole um, travel process, payment process. We've gone through a, um, a very diligent um, sail safe program. And um, given that we are Australian flagged and we have majority of Australian passengers and crew, it makes it much easier or a good starting point for us to be able to um, commence cruising and um, exploring the waters of, um, of Australia. Our approved sail safe plan it's quite comprehensive, but um, I must say very detailed and very reassuring for all concerned. So our major um, concern was making sure that guests and crew felt comfortable sailing and getting back out on the water. We do have um, the, we do ask for all of our guests to do a medical pre-screening test and the COVID-19 um, PCR test before cruising. Now, also that PCR test and the medical test our crew and even office staff who are going down to the ships must have all of this done. So we're ensuring that um, it is as COVID free as possible. A big plan name is called the Sail Safe. So as I've been saying, it is the health and safety plan for guests and crew. This can be found on our website. So if you're going onto the website of coralexpeditions.com. And actually, it's not .com.au, it's just .com. You'll see on the top banner COVID-19 information. In here, you'll be able to download the, um, the COVID safe, um, sale safe plan. It's a PDF document. You also have your health questionnaire um, form for guests and um, uh, for your guests to complete. And there's also a range of FAQs for you to do this. It is important that all guests, all of your clients receive this information. We will be communicating with you directly and with the guests on making sure that they read the important information and have this completed. But the reason why you're all here is joining us to learn a little bit more about the Kimberley, getting excited for um, travel in 2021 when we recommence in the Kimberley. We do, we're going to be operating, we've been doing the Kimberley for over 25 years now and we operate the cruise from Darwin to Broome. In 2021, we will have three ships operating, the Coral Discoverer, the Coral Adventurer, and Coral Geographer, our brand new vessel. This means the reason why we've put more ships on for the Kimberley in 21 is we needed to increase the number of departures that we have. Many of our guests, and with your support, we've been able to defer those who've had their travel impacted in 2020 to travel with us in 21 but we also wanted to make sure that we had the availability for new bookings. So we still have availability for any new bookings or interest and in groups for traveling with us in 21. Any guests that, that has had their travel deferred from this year receiving a credit note, they're also, if they find that they can't travel next year, there's no validity date on our credit notes. They can use it towards any future cruising um, with Coral Expeditions and make a date change should they wish, if they decide that 21 they don't want to travel, but they can go in 22. So it's quite fluid and flexible. All you need to do is ring our friendly reservations team and um, they'll be able to help you or even Ramona, Liz Soares or myself, we can answer any of those questions as well. So um, without further ado, I would like to introduce you to Ian Morris. Ian has been with us for many years. He's one of our very much loved 
um, guest lecturers. He is an expert on the Kimberley and the Arnhem Land region. And um, I'm more than sure he's excited to be getting out there and exploring the Kimberley yet again. So Ian, welcome and thank you for joining us. Morning, Liz. Yes. Good day to everybody. Um, it's, uh, it's a pretty special place, this Kimberley, and I'm sort of missing it a little bit, sitting up here in uh, the top end of the NT. But uh, it'll be great just going over some of our, uh, our favourite locations and, uh, and subjects on the Kimberley this morning. Now that there is where often we start at the beginning of the season and what you're looking at is the beautiful old sandstone escarpment. It's like a great big geological wedding cake. And during the wet season, we get uh, monsoonal rains uh, thundering down on top of the escarpment and it runs uh, to the edge, this beautiful water. And over the edge, in, in this case, in the King George River, that water thunders down in, in to start the uh, marine part of the King George River. And so we get to see that at that time of year. It's really, really amazing. So that's sort of how it is at the start of, uh, of our tourist season, I suppose, each year. Water gushing everywhere. As you can see there, we've got lots of um, landscape associated with the edge of this wonderful old sandstone plateau. And I guess that's, that's, that's one of the main scenic values of the Kimberley. It's just a, it's a big, big old ancient lump of rock uh, with all sorts of weathered features, uh, waterfalls, pools, um, eroded surfaces, colours. Um, and uh, I've been doing it for over 20 years for coral expeditions and it never wears off. <laughs> Every time you go there, whether it's 10 times a year, it doesn't matter. It is a stunning place and there's always something different for us to see. Um, and I guess the thing I like most is to see other guests with their mouths open going, oh, wow. Uh, every time we pull into the coastline and have a look at these beautiful features. It is an unusual part of Australia and it's, it's breathtaking. I definitely did the oh wow moments quite a few times when I did the cruise um, a couple of years ago. So I can I de uh, definitely state it's a wow moment, a real bucket list experience. It also has a lot of human history. Um, it's got a, a massive amount of Aboriginal history, much of which we're still learning. It's also got European history and what you're looking at there is uh, a relic from uh, World War II. Um, it's an old downed uh, military aircraft, um, advanced at Hart Bay, and uh, it's about, uh, about a kilometre inland and uh, a lovely flat walking trail into it. So it's one of the places we can visit on foot when we get ashore um, with our explorer and go and have a look at the sort of things that happened uh, back in the 1940s um, when Australia was uh, trying to get itself set up to uh, defend the shoreline uh, in the Second World War. Also, uh, in the same general area, Van Sittard Bay, now we're moving from uh, east, from Darwin across the Bonaparte Gulf into the Kimberley and we continue going west right around to Broome. So this is one of our early stops and it's a place called Jar Island. Um, now Jar Island, it was a, a wonderful traditional place uh, for Aboriginal people to gather and have ceremonies and uh, to do their artwork, which you're looking at there. Um, and some of this artwork is uh, known by the anthropologists as is the oldest art in Australia and some of the oldest in the world. It goes back uh, beyond 20,000 years. So some of those simple mono-coloured uh, drawings, like the one bottom left there, um, they're only stains on the rock now. The, the red ochre that they would have used is long gone, but the uh, iron in the, in the paint has uh, kind of stained the surface of the sandstone and uh, become part of the rock. So that's how they've lasted so long against uh, all the elements, the wind and the, water, the rain from the wet season, the animals running all over the surface all the time. Uh, they are still there um, as marvellous uh, examples of human occupation in Australia well back beyond 20,000 years. So we're able to walk around and visit some of these, uh, these galleries. Sometimes we're lucky enough to be there with the traditional owners um, who live in a nearby community called Columbaroo. Um, and... Uh, even, even for the indigenous people of today, 
this stuff is really, really old, almost beyond their knowledge. It's so old. It's, it's a really ancient piece of human history. So we're very privileged to be able to see places like Jar Island. Ian, yep. you talked about walking around and exploring. Can you talk about a little bit of the terrain and what our guests would experience and about the uh, capabilities of being able to walk and what maybe what kind of shoes and equipment and, and the safety aspect of it and how easy or challenging or how we, we look after all of our guests on board? Yep, well, as you can see in the top photo there, um, it's a sandstone surface, but it's relatively level and most of our guests uh, have little difficulty in getting up to some of these art sites. There are some more difficult ones that, for the, the, uh, the fitter people, but uh, pretty well all our guests can go and see some of this art fairly close to the shoreline, fairly level. Um, you've got to have good footwear. People often take a walking stick, uh, which we supply. Um, but other than that, um, it's a fairly easy exercise to see this, uh, this ancient uh, Gion Gion art, as the Aboriginal people call it, um, hidden in the crevices around this beautiful island. Beautiful. The other interesting thing with Jar Island is that um, it got its name from some pottery that was found by one of our early uh, navigators, uh, a clay pot, which was attributed to the Makassan people from Eastern Indonesia, who visited this Northern coastline annually to harvest our marine resources. Long before European colonization of Australia, we were being visited by these Macassan people as they're generally termed. And uh, they brought a lot of culture and technology with them, which they exchanged with the coastal Aboriginal people. And uh, so Jar Island got its name because this was one of those places where they used to camp and set up their, uh, their cleaning stations for the treat pan, which was um, cooked and dried and stacked and taken back to Indonesia and eventually was uh, passed on and sold in China. So this great big industry was going on along our northern coastline long before Captain Cook uh, hit the east coast. Interesting. I love how the connections between our, um, our closest um, neighbours, the Indonesian area and, and Australia, and the history, you forget about that. And it's not something, you know, in my school days, I didn't learn about it. And I always found, find it very interesting learning something new every day. So thank you. That's right, most of our guests haven't heard of this. Um, and we're lucky enough in this company to be able to get up to uh, Makassar, which is the, the uh, capital city of the uh, island of Sulawesi. And those Makassar people are still there. And this is in their history as well. So we're actually able to share from both sides uh, uh, these days, which is uh, uh, quite a privilege, really. You can see in the bottom left photo there, um, we uh, quite often will uh, put our deck chairs on the beach and do sunset drinks uh, and watch the, the beautiful setting sun over the Kimberley uh, horizon there. Really, uh, really take in a, a very pleasant evening. That time of year, once the wet season stops, we have just stunning evenings right through the dry season. Uh, very, very calm weather conditions right through till about October. So uh, sunset drinks on the beach is, is a bit of a highlight. We'll, we do it as often as we can. You can see there too, um, where the old weathered sandstone has just deteriorated in, in millions of years uh, from a, a very, very big, strong square formation down to these lovely artistic landscapes where the constant wet seasons have eroded the sandstone and carried the sand away and given us these uh, particularly beautiful features. And um, as you can see, we also do provide, or you, our guests uh, on board do have the choice of doing an optional helicopter flight over the Mitchell Falls, uh, travelling up the Mitchell River and over the Mitchell Falls. So that's an optional extra the guests can do. Indeed. And uh, it's one that shouldn't be missed too. It is fantastic seeing the Kimberley from a helicopter from up high, a uh, different aspect all over again. But we always provide options. So some people like to walk, some people like to fly, some people like to cruise in the Explorer while the others are on shore. So um, there's, there's a variety of options. And what you're looking at here is another one of those beautiful sandstone formations. And uh, up on top uh, on these horizontal layers is, is much harder sandstone than down below. And uh, what's happened here is a, uh, what we call elephant leg weathering has occurred at a lower level and made this labyrinth of caves and inside those caves, there, there are tunnels going um, in two directions. And there's a lot of native animals which come out at night, uh, possums, uh, geckos, um, all sorts of weird invertebrates. So we go inside with our little head torches and we see a lot of these 
animals that you normally can't see in daytime um, sheltering in these long, cool tunnels. So that's just one of the many uh, neat aspects of the Kimberley. You can actually see night animals during the day. Um, you can see the patterns in the sandstone there showing the different layers and the different colorings of minerals in the different layers. And then when you get weathering occurring, you get these beautiful patterns. And uh, also there's another example on the right of the sort of artwork. This is more recent style. Um, there's many eras in the Aboriginal artwork over the long human history of the Kimberley. So we now know um, a fair bit about each of the styles that we're looking at and roughly um, the period uh, in time when these, these artworks were, uh, were done. So uh, it just adds another human dimension to this uh, stunning landscape. This looks absolutely stunning. One of the advantages I think we have in uh, coral expeditions is the explorer vessel. You'll see it in, in subsequent photos, um, but we can put all our passengers into the explorer or explorers. We've got two of them on the bigger boats and uh, we can go right into the remote, uh, difficult to access places and, and see this sort of scene here where you've got a mangrove forest coming down into a, a big tidal bay and uh, they're nice and comfortable, you're shaded, uh, they're quiet, you can get right up close to a lot of the wildlife. And in this photo, this is uh, a photo that I took um, not that long ago, actually, where a, a three metre saltwater crocodile swam in to look at all the tourists. And he swam around and looked at all our different vessels. There's two of our explorer boats there and some of our, what we call rubber duckies, our little Zodiac uh, rubber craft that get us right into the, um, into the shallow places. And this crocodile just swam around and, and he was having as much fun as the tourists were taking his photo. And that's the nice thing about the Kimberley, the wildlife there is pretty unhassled. So it's approachable and the crocodiles are not that scared and they're not the killing machines that we're taught that they are. They're actually another kind of animal that is curious and, and quite happy in the company of people. And uh, so we enjoy showing our, our guests how good these crocodiles are, saltwater crocodiles. They've got a bad reputation, but they're actually a good animal. So uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's one of the highlights for me is getting people up close to things like that. Here we are again, same sort of area, that lovely old sandstone plateau, just weathering away at the coastline there and uh, big volumes of fresh water being pumped down every wet season, uh, slowly wearing away at the whole landscape. Lovely old um, art styles again, that's a more modern one, the one in the middle at the bottom there. Um, and we lay on our backs to see that. So there you can see some of our staff, uh, including me actually, um, taking photos on this uh, cave roof of uh, some, some more modern style of art. And, and the modern style today um, is actually still being maintained or the Aboriginal people say refreshed, the stories are celebrated and the art in certain places um, is refreshed by the uh, relevant artists of that clan in that geographical area. So the culture is still living, it's still there today. And uh, usually we're lucky enough to meet some of the traditional owners along somewhere along this coastline on our voyages. So that's, that just brings it all to life for us. Oh, good. Is this in the waterfall season, beginning of the season? Well, this uh, King Cascade, as it's called, named after that early navigator, Philip Parker King, uh, it's well up the Prince Regent River. Um, and we anchor our ships down in the, towards the mouth of the river. And we take our explorer 40 kilometers up uh, and we see this magnificent cascade. And it, it's, it also looks like this in the dry season. Oh, wow. uh, most of the year it is running. It backs off quite a bit. That's an early dry season photo. Uh, but by the end of the dry season, it's still running. Uh, but the you know, water flow has backed off quite a bit. But that's, um, that's one of the historic places on the Prince Regent River, about halfway down the uh, Kimberley coastline, where Philip Parker King uh, was able to fill his uh, wooden water barrels with his crew um, and get fresh water supplied for the rest of his uh, navigation down the Kimberley coast. So uh, yeah, it's one of, the, one of the breathtaking spots we visit. And there you can see in the top right and in the bottom left, uh, or all three actually, um, you can see our explorers in against the Cascades. Later on in the dry season, you see the water flow has dropped off a bit. That'd be September, October probably. Um, and there's some lovely friendly geckos laying on the mud there. Um, <laughs> I think they might be crocodiles actually. Um, and they're quite used to us. Uh, they let us come right up close and take photos. 
Um, the big old fella there, he's always around. He hardly opens his eyes when we turn up. He's that used to us. And that's a white belly seagull in the uh, top left there, just cruising over the cascade. So that's, that's one of our uh, destinations we really enjoy going to. We see a lot of wildlife and fantastic scenery there. A lot of history at this place. Ah, uh, yes. Okay. Well, that man, Philip Parker King, that I was telling you about, um, he was the second navigator to, uh, to come along the coastline. The first one, of course, was Matthew Flinders, but King came after Flinders about 20 years later, and he did the navigation and the mapping of the coastline uh, in great detail. And one of the places he camped on the Kimberley coastline uh, was a place called Careening Bay, named because he had to put his vessel ashore. It was an old wooden vessel. And it had a hard life, well, caught a lot, lot of leaky bits. So he and his men had to pull the old girl up onto the shoreline. And there's a, there's a drawing of it there in the, the um, bottom left. And, uh, and fix those leaks. And that big old boab tree, double trunked boab tree there, which we call the mermaid tree or the mermaid boab, um, his artist carved the mermaid's name into that tree um, as, as a memorial to the time that they spent. And you can see the bottom right there, the, uh, the drawing of their campsite. Um, and that tree is still there. We love visiting that tree. And uh, you're looking directly at Philip Parker King's um, own handwriting, if you like. Just going to move along here. I love right. this. this is beautiful Montgomery Reef and just seeing it come out, rise out of the water. It's like, um, you know, it's just amazing nature at its best. Yes, we're offshore now, uh, and you can look way in the distance there, you can see the shoreline. So um, we're, uh, we're about 30 kilometres offshore, and there's this marvellous, what they call platform reef. It's a big coral reef, similar to uh, um, the barrier reef in one way, but quite different in another. Um, underneath this reef is sandstone, as you'd expect along the Kimberley coastline. But the sandstone platform is just below sea level. The coral has grown all over it, metres deep, uh, and is now above uh, sea level at low tide. So we're able to get right in close. Um, we take our explorer or explorers in um, with all our passengers, and then we can jump out into a rubber ducky, into a zodiac uh, from the explorer, and go right in close and have a good look at the little coral formations that are all around this wonderful platform reef, Montgomery Reef, and uh, it's full of life. So the closer you get, the more you see. So that's one of the advantages of uh, coral expeditions, I think, um, over all the other companies, is that we can get our passengers in comfort all the way in there, and then if they choose, they can jump out of the Explorer into a Zodiac and go right in shallow, as you can see in the bottom right there, and take photos of the coral organisms. And, uh, oh, we see all sorts of things there. Um, beautiful eels and, and uh, sea snake species catching fish and uh, big stingrays are going past. It's, it's alive with, um, with life, really. And the, the irony is, at high tide, this whole structure goes under the ocean up to about three metres. Um, and so it's only exposed uh, the lower half of the low tide. Uh, and it looks like it's emerging out of the ocean. And it's hundreds of square kilometres of reef. It, it is an enormous reef. It's, I'm told it's the biggest platform reef in the world. So Montgomery Reef is uh, one of our regular places. Um, and not far away from that is uh, in Doubtful Bay. Uh, are these formations here? One looks like Ayers Rock at sea. Um, and that's a little, um, I guess, eroded island that was part of the mainland. Um, and is now worn down to, uh, to a little, little platform out at sea. Um, and it's quite significant to the Warora Aboriginal people as part of their human history. They tell a lot of stories um, about that little island. And of course, on the left-hand side of that, that panorama is the mainland, uh, what they call High Bluff. And we spent a fair bit of time in that area. There's some beautiful art sites um, in the caves and overhangs there to go and visit. Um, and just being there early morning or late afternoon and seeing the light effects on these cliffs is... Uh, something you never forget. It's, it's, you won't see it anywhere else in the world as far as I can see. It's, it's, a, it's a unique Kimberley feature, the beautiful light effect on that escarpment. And just talking about the colours that you were saying between the different times of day and everything, the beautiful ochres and the sunsets and the vibrant blues, moving over to um, Talbot Bay and Horizontal Falls is another extreme of 
you just want to jump in that water and swim because it looks absolutely picturesque and so sparkling blue. That's right. Anybody that's been to Ayers Rock and knows the colour change in that rock surface as the sun sets, that's the sort of effect you get in the Kimberley on a massive scale and uh, more variable colour and just wonderful features. So we're looking down out of an aircraft now um, at what we call the Horizontal Falls, which um, is a drowned mountain range. And uh, in the mountain range are some gaps. And as the massive Kimberley tides move up and down, water squeezes through these narrow gaps um, under high pressure. And uh, slowly it's widening those gaps. And as you can see down there, one of our zodiacs going through with some um, passengers hanging on very tight, because you can see the strength of the current. Um, we get to, to experience this. And when you're a little rubber zodiac in, in situations like this, you really feel the, the, the strength of nature underneath you. And it's something you'll never forget. Uh, most people, their uh, eyeballs are white and they're hanging on with white knuckles. Uh, uh, when they've done it, it's just one of the most fantastic little things to, to get in there and feel the strength of, of these massive Kimberley tides. Um, they go up to 13 metres difference between high and low tide. So you can imagine the, the gaps when that's happening. And again, in the quieter places, you can see the, the Earth's history all around you. You can see that um, a long time ago, sandstone uh, was formed uh, in warm tropical seas underwater in layers, layer upon layer upon layer. Then we understand that it was lifted up uh, by some of the deep Earth's pressures uh, above sea, well above sea level. Um, and then slowly, uh, pressures from the side have caused the buckles and the ripples uh, and you can see in those layers, it's all been uh, heated and, and, uh, and then squashed and pushed um, in all sorts of directions to give us what we're looking at today. And then of course, it's all slowly eroding, but we're seeing this beautiful layer. That, um, that peninsula over there is, uh, there's nothing like it geologically that I've ever seen anywhere else in Australia. Um, and uh, yeah, obviously the birds enjoy it. Um, Quite a bit of the Kimberley is nature reserve. And thank goodness for that, really. Um, a few times in its history, it's nearly been mined for one product or another. And fortunately, we've been able to put it aside and look after it. You can see the happy faces on those brown boobies there. But uh, the Lassipede Islands is one part of that conservation zone. Uh, and again, one of the values on the Lassipede Islands, again, about 40 kilometers offshore, is that a lot of our marine animals, the birds, the turtles, um, and many other things can come ashore and breed uninhibited. They can have their eggs and their, their hatchlings and so forth on these islands um, and they're protected by modern law. So we can go there and see all this. We see the turtles uh, mating and, and the females hauling themselves up the beaches to lay their big clutch of eggs. I got eggs. to see all of that. And you got to see all of that, yeah. And uh, there's nothing quite like it. The Barrier Reef is has got some of this, but quite different. And of course, the species over on the western side of Australia are a fair bit different to the, the bird species that you see on the eastern side. Again, top right there, we've got um, uh, a little hatchling turtle. Uh, and we often see these um, little baby turtles on the, on the turtle nesting beaches of the Kimberley. Um, and uh, middle one at the top there is way our short-eared rock wallaby, a mother one with a little baby looking out of its pouch. We often see these lovely little macropods peering at us from the ledges as we go along and the explore along the coastline. Um, they're quite common there, living in the sandstone crevices. Um, flying fish, we quite often see, uh, particularly when we're anchored at night, these flying fish will come around the lights of the, the ships at night and they're beautiful colours. Um, bottom left there, we've got a whistling kite and of course, humpback whale in the middle and uh, our favourite old uh, lizard down there, bottom right is the saltwater crocodile, of course. And the, um, the flora and the fauna up in the Kimberleys is also amazing. And a lot of these photos Ian has taken personally and um, shared with the, the team at Coral Expeditions. So um, getting close to the bird life, the insect life, and as I said, the, um, the flora and the fauna is just absolutely spectacular. The colours and the vibrancy. It just really adds to the Kimberley experience. Exactly. And I, I'm an animal person. I, I, I just get right off on all of this. Um, so to talk about each of these photos would take me a week. But there's so <laughs> many unique things in the Kimberley. And we keep seeing more. And one of the advantages of our company is we report back to the uh, Parks and Wildlife and, and other people 
uh, from places that they find it very difficult to get to. So we're seeing things that very few other people get the privilege of seeing. So a lot of this is recorded uh, and sent back to the authorities uh, so that we can properly uh, look after the natural environment. So we feel like we're doing a job for conservation as well. So this really makes the overall experience and all of our guests feel part of it and the information that we share with the nature, um, with the wildlife parks and the associations and the marine parks, etc. It's part of the overall experience that our guests have on shore and on board the coral expedition cruises to um, the Kimberley. And the ability to get to and from the ship across to the shore movement, being able to do a walking tour or, or a cruising around particular areas, or even just staying on board and doing engine room tours and open bridge policies. Um, it makes it um, adaptable for all guest experiences. And as I said before, our team there are very um, welcome to have a chat, talk about anything and everything. Um, and you can ask them any of the questions they may want to answer, they may not want to answer, but um, we just try to make it as comfortable and as an Australian experience as possible. You can see on the bottom left-hand photo, the ease of getting from the, um, the ship onto the Explorer tender as well. So it's um, abilities going across to the shore and just stepping across and it's capable for all um, age groups. The food, I joined the company and thought I was going to lose weight, but definitely not when you go on board the ship and um, Ian can attest to this. Oh yeah. Eating and indulging on the beautiful food, it is all chef prepared on board and we can cater to all dietary requirements. Just tell us at the time of booking. And like any true good Australian company, we have one or two bars on board the ship as well and selling um, and providing good quality Australian wines. We also do have some new wine packages that can be pre-purchased um, for your guests. And these packages are available on the website and they are commissionable for all agents. We have, um, as I was saying, we've got our um, exp um, onboard experience. So being able to move into the lounges, into the um, open bridge policy, learn about navigating and mapping and learning where we're going, learning about the maritime history of Australia. Or if you just want to sit back, enjoy reading a book or playing um, some Scrabble, you can do that as well. We have three ships in our fleet, um, the Coral Discoverer, the Coral Adventure and the new coral geographer who will be taking delivery of her in um, January next year and she will be on the Kimberley in 2021 for the first season. So we had, we've had a few changes to our sailing schedule this year. I think we're up to version 33 at the moment but we are currently operating the Kimberley cruises from March through to October next year with all of these three vessels. You can see that um, they're very well appointed, very spacious the staterooms are serviced daily with turn down service every night. And we have our one seating um, dining, so you can sit anywhere that you like in the dining room. And to abide by social distancing, we're opening up the aft deck. So we'll have dining al fresco as well as in the dining room. So accommodating um, to the, either the 72 passengers or on the larger ships, 100 passengers. So we're capping that at 100 for um, 21. Um, Coral Adventure, we took ownership of, or she was delivered in April last year. Very, very comfortable vessel. And then the sister ship, the Coral Geographer. Um, so we're very happy with how things are progressing here at Coral Expeditions. And as I said at the beginning, we really do thank you for your continued support. On our pre-cruise documentation or anything that we send out, we provide packing tips and information tips about the trips. So it's good reading for yourself to understand more about our expedition cruises, but also good um, heads up information for the guests to be able to pack the right equipment and making sure that they've got the comfortable walking shoes or they've got their camera or their backpack. Um, we've also um, removed all plastic on board. So a water bottle, we now provide um, an aluminum, uh, aluminium, sorry, um, water bottle. Um, and we've got the fresh water taps um, on board so that they can keep replenishing their water as they wish. So those are all made available and labelled with their name in their staterooms upon arrival. We have a very comprehensive trade resources site that um, Ramona, our sales executive, has been very much busily making sure everything's up to date and information of everything that we have. Um, so that is available in our trade resources area on our website. You can find that at the bottom, um, the links at the bottom of the, um, at the footers of our website pages. 
for any bookings or any information that you need for Coral Expeditions, um, please either email Coral Expeditions, explore at coralexpeditions.com or ring, or ring through and you'll get one of us. Um, we've also got, um, in saying that, time if you like. I know we've run over a little bit, but um, questions and answers, more than happy. Ian and I are more than happy to take that. You probably want to speak to Ian more than you speak to me, but um, we're happy to take any questions that you may have. Um, if you can type them into the chat box, I will work out how to call up the messages. But thank you. Give it a couple of more seconds in case you do have any questions that you may want. But as I said, um, you can email us. Um, and if you've got a personal question for Ian and want further information, he's been working diligently behind the scenes and keeping in touch with the team. So um, we can go through. Okay, got a chat. Oh, thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Thank you for that. We do um, like it and we wish you a wonderful day and um, have a great day. Keep selling, keep um, keeping positive um, like we are here at Coral and um, look forward to meeting you again one day soon when we're able to travel. Thank you.